Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Berman Center for the Performing Arts. We kindly ask that you take this moment to turn off any phones, watches, or devices that can make noise or light up and distract other audience members. Also, please note that also, please know that the taking of photos or videos of this performance is strictly prohibited. Thank you. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Good, e good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Judy Lobel, and I am the Chief Program Officer of the J. It's so wonderful to see all of you here at the J. We're so often asked, what's happening at the J? And I hope you see that this, along with so many other programs, we're offering every day, all the time. Um, this, is, this has been a tremendously successful event, and we have another sold out event coming, our matzah factory, next Sunday. If you don't know what's going on at the J, come and see me or any of our staff have a talk, and I can probably spend 10 minutes telling you about everything that's going on. So we're thrilled to have you. Make sure you get on our email list so you can hear what's happening. Tonight's event is brought to you by SAGE, Seminars for Adult Jewish Enrichment, a program of the J that brings enlightening speakers to the community year round. SAGE is endowed by a generous gift from Sis Mizell and supported by Carol and Ronald Fogel, Sherry and David Jaffa, Elaine and Michael Ser Serling, through the J's Pillar of Light program. The J is supported by the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Detroit. We thank all of our donors and all of you for your support. Thank you to the SAGE Committee, and especially to our co-chairs, Leslie Black and Debbie Levin. A huge thank you to our SAGE staff, Naomi Levine, Lauren Johnson, and Steve Kantrowitz. We couldn't offer these wonderful programs without you. And thank you to the J staff, Shelley and Dahlia, and everyone else who helped out with this event tonight. Neil on the speakers. I do want to, so I don't forget, mention that this will be recorded. So if you think that this was a worthwhile program, um, we will have it up very soon. And you can um, tell your friends that they can watch it um, online. And if you contact our department, our office, the SAGE office, they can tell you how to do that. We'd also like to thank tonight's co-sponsors, JCRC, AJC, Congregation Sharad Sadek, the David Hordecker Organization, and the Zionist Organization of America, Michigan Region. Additional thanks to Eugene Greenstein, Malka Littman, Rana Ross, Ed Cole, and Linda Cohn for helping to bring this event to fruition. SAGE has a wide range of exciting events over the next several months, including hidden musical gems from Yiddish soundtracks featuring the acclaimed Klezmer group, Isle of Klezbos and Friends. And that will be Thursday, April 27th at 7 p.m. And it's the opening of the 25th annual Lenore Marwell Detroit Jewish Film Festival, which will run from April 27th through May 9th here in the Berman and at the Imagine Royal Oak. And now tonight's program. Professor Howard Lukovich earned his PhD in history from Columbia University and is currently a professor of history and the director of the Cone Haddow Center for Judaic Studies at Wayne State University. His latest book on the history of Budapest Jewish community was published last fall. He is, com is currently completing a study of Neolog Judaism and is writing a history of Jews of Detroit since 1967. Howard is a popular J Learn instructor teaching classes on Jewish history and culture. And by the way, J Learn is a part of the J. David Bernstein is the founder of the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, which, is a pro which opposes illiberal ideologies and supports liberal values in and out of the Jewish community, and is the author of Woke Antisemitism, How a Progressive Ideology Harms Jews. He is also co-founder of the Institute for Liberal Values, a consortium of like-minded organizations supporting liberal principles. 
He's past president and CEO of Jewish Council for Public Affairs and former executive director of the David Project. He spent 13 years at the American Jewish Committee in senior roles. David is a prolific speaker, podcaster, and writer. Our conversational partner is Rabbi Aaron Starr, who serves as spiritual leader of Congregation Sharat Tzedek and has been there since 2008. He is also a rabbinic fellow of the Sholem Hartman Institute's Rabbinic Leadership Initiative. Tonight, we will only be taking written questions. Please write down your question and we will collect them. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. We ask that you remain courteous and respectful to the speakers and each other, even if you disagree with the point of view. Thank you, and it's now my pleasure to welcome Professor Helen Lupovich, David Bernstein, and Rabbi Aaron Starr. Good evening and Chodesh Tov. We come to this conversation during a challenging period. As a community, we're spending millions of dollars each year on security, especially in the prevention of gun violence and other forms of violent terrorism. Just recently, the ADL reported a record 3,697 incidents in the United States in 2022, the highest since the ADL started keeping records in 1979. At colleges around the country, Jewish students feel the need to closet their Judaism and to avoid talk of Israel. And most recently, Bloomfield Hills High School hosted a diversity day at which the guest speaker, an American of Palestinian descent, subjected her teenage audience to accusations against Israel of it being an oppressor and apartheid state, thereby opening a Pandora's box of intertribal conflict in which, from what I hear, Muslim and Jewish students subjected each other to bullying and discrimination. As a sidebar, it is now incumbent upon all of us in the broader community to let the school district go through its processes and to encourage the entire student body to behave with respect and compassion toward each other. We cannot accept bullying against our kids. We also cannot condone our own children behaving in such ways toward others. So this is the climate we are now in as we turn to our point counterpoint on anti-Semitism and progressive politics. As we prepare to begin, allow me please to offer a quotation from the Talmud. Rabbi Abba said in the name of Shmuel, for three years there was a dispute between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel the former asserting that the halakha, the Jewish law, is in agreement with our views, and the latter contending the halakha, the Jewish law, is in agreement with our views. Then Abat Kol, a heavenly voice, announced, Elu ve'elu divrei elokim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. Our opportunity tonight is to hear from two distinguished scholars, both of whom are committed to strengthening and protecting the Jewish people, and both of whom want to do only what is good and what is right in the eyes of God. Let us give them the respect they deserve, whether they agree with us or not. In fact, I might suggest that each of us this evening listens most generously to the person who offers differing perspectives from our own. This is how we grow, and by showing respect and kindness toward every Jew, this is how we attain real safety and real success for the Jewish people. So let us begin. Given the tremendous rise in anti-Semitism, has the window closed on the golden age of American Jewry? And if so, what is to blame? David, I'll let you take that question first. Given the tremendous rise in anti-Semitism, has the window closed on the golden age of American Jewry? And if so, what is to blame? Yeah, well, first of all, let me say it's just really wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in conversation with Howard. I, I, in doing my recon, I had a chance to watch a video or two of, of Howard, and I thought, what a thoughtful Menchie guy. And I'm so <laughs> delighted to be uh, in discussion here. I'm sure we'll find some points to talk about, but in the meantime, I'm really delighted, and it's great to be with all of you, you here. here. Um, so has the golden age ended? Look. It is good to be Jewish in America today. By and large, we are safe. By and large, we are protected by the institutions of democracy. By and large, we have rights. By and large, we have voice. By and large, 
We are one of the most, the most successful diaspora communities in Jewish history. So we have a lot to be thankful for and grateful for. But at the same time, we are facing extreme polarization in this country, some of which has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with us. So if you ask Americans in a survey, as we've done, as the Pew survey did in 2019, what do you think of American Jews? And overwhelmingly, they admire us, overwhelmingly. In fact, American Jews are the most admired religious community in America. That said, at the same time, perhaps because of the unease and insecurity that so many Americans are facing, because of the challenges to our democratic norms coming from both ends of the political spectrum, we have factions that are more radical than we've seen in a long time. We have right-wing extremists who are opposing democratic norms in this country, and we have left-wing extremists as well. And in the conspiracy theories that they hold, and the ideologies that are animating them, they are putting us at greater risk of anti-Semitism. And we are now feeling that anti-Semitism. Perhaps this is an opportunity, though, while we're talking about it, for me to say that, that we shouldn't minimize anti-Semitism coming from the other ideological camp, no matter where we are. In fact, I would argue, first and foremost, we should deal with the anti-Semitism in our own political camp. That is where we're most influential. That is where we have the greatest responsibility. So the right should deal with the right, and the left should deal with the left. We can talk about each other a little bit, but let's really focus on our own camp. Um, Jonathan Greenblatt, who is the president and CEO of the ADL, likes to say that anti-Semitism on the right is like a hurricane, and anti-Semitism on the left is like climate change. It is slower moving, it is more corrosive, but it is not as immediately potentially violent. I think that's a perfectly apt metaphor, but I do think that the two manifest themselves differently, and I think we need to dive into why we're seeing anti-Semitism on both ends and what to do about it, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to do that. But just to sum up, I think this is a marvelous time to be Jewish, but we also have to be more vigilant than ever. Professor, I'll turn the same question to you. Are, is the window closed on the golden age of American Jewry? And if so, what is to blame? Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank you and all the other organizations and Jay Learn and the Berman for sponsoring this event. I'm really glad to be a part of it. And of course, welcome, David. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm glad, Rabbi Starr, I'm glad you're doing this as well. And, uh, you know, Eugene, wherever you are out there, and Malka Lippman, you know, you know, in my introduction, the one thing Judy forgot to mention is that I am a proud graduate of Hillel Day School, and uh, my children also went there. And uh, you know, if you if you've had if you went or you had children who went to Hillel Day School in the last thirty or forty years, you know that Malka Littman was part of the dream team of Hillel Day School Hebrew teachers. So there's no way I'm not going to acknowledge that Malka for sure. So to your question, I would say two things. First of all, I would say that. Every generation of American Jews for the last 300 years was convinced it was the last generation. They were convinced that the openness of American society was not conducive for Jewish survival or the transmission of Jewish tradition and identity and community from one generation to the next. And thankfully, every generation was wrong. And we are simply the latest in a series of generations of American Jews asking ourselves, how are we possibly going to survive when conditions are so good? So <laughs> that, that gives me hope only because, you know, we, if, if we didn't survive, we'd be breaking a pattern for the last 300 years. That, so, so, so I would say that first. The other thing in terms of, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would echo what David said. I would take it a step further. We, have, we still, in spite of the recent surge of anti-Semitism, it is still very good for us here. This is a remarkable situation. I would go a step further and say that in the second half of the 20th century and the 21st century, we have not only one of the greatest diaspora Jewish communities, but we have a sovereign Jewish state. So in terms of security, in terms of confidence, in terms of just what we have politically, uh, this, this is an embarrassment of riches that no other Jewish community in the diaspora has enjoyed, I mean, since antiquity. Now, as far as the recent surge of anti-Semitism, I would say this, that, you know, anti-Semitism, it's, it's, uh, it manifests itself in, all different, in a number of different ways. But the common thread, 
between all of these different forms of anti-Semitism, I, I would suggest is this. So if, you if you look at anti-Semites, regardless of where they are in the political spectrum or whatever, there are three common threads among anti-Semites. The first is they, tend to, is they are narrow-minded, the second is they are extreme, and the third is they are not critical thinkers. It's rare to find someone who is broad-minded, moderate, and a, crit and a critical thinker who is also anti-Semitic, and I would add who's also racist, or homophobic, or misogynistic, or Islamophobic. All of those things are, you don't find in broad-minded, moderate, uh, critical thinkers. And one of the reasons for that is, is that anti-Semitism, like other forms of discrimination, feed on hate and outrage, and if you're a critical thinker, you're able to see through what the bill of goods that is trying to be, that, is, that there are those who are trying to sell you. If nothing else, a critical thinker will hear an, uns an unsubstantiated conspiracy theory, which inevitably wind up being about Jews, and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. So the, the goal for us as a community, and this is independent of our political leanings, is just to be as broad-minded, moderate, and critical thinking as we can. So thank you very much. I'm, I'm gonna pick up on something you said with regard to critical thinking, because I think everybody defines themselves as a critical thinker, right? We might often project on others they're not a critical thinker because they hold these discriminatory attitudes. Um, and so let's take it now to the left, all right? Our focus is now gonna be on progressive politics, left-wing anti-Semitism, a lot of whom are self-identified as critical thinkers, a few of whom show up on college campuses. Um, and so I wanna head in that direction now, David, if we can. Are progressive politics and woke ideology the same thing? And how would you define them? Yeah, good question. So first of all, I don't think all progressive politics is quote unquote woke. I'm using it in air quotes, so it should be, should be okay. Um, um, what, well, um, progressive, po there are different brands of progressive politics. Um, there, are, there are people who are more focused on class-based issues in this country. They might even call themselves socialists, and some of them are actually quite critical of the woke wing of the progressive movement. So what do we mean by woke? It's interesting, I was just having an argument with my 21-year-old stepdaughter about socialism, and you, something you might want to avoid. But um, <laughs> the, um, the, the, about 15 minutes into it, I realized that we actually did not share an understanding of what socialism was. For me, it was the traditional, you know, the government ownership of the means of production, like the traditional Marxist definition. And for her, it was just being generous in terms of, you know, social society's welfare state. And, um, and I think that's the case with a lot of terms like, like wokeism, like fascism sometimes as well, is that we, different people have different understandings of what we're talking about. Unfortunately for people like me who are critical of what you might call woke ideology, the Radical voices on the right are throwing it around the word around too promiscuously. They're calling anybody on the left they don't like woke, and as a result, it's sort of demeaning the term. And on the far left, you have voices who will discredit any term that you try to use to describe this sweeping social and political reform that, that they're demanding. And so we need to have a word. I don't know if it's something else, maybe Howard, you have a good idea. I'm all in. But we do need a word to describe this ideology. So what is the ideology? What is woke ideology? What do I mean by woke ideology? I, mean, I believe that woke ideology has two tenets. One is that bias and oppression are not just a matter of one's personal opinion or personal attitude, but are ingrained in the very systems and structures of society. They're like in the air that we breathe. That's one. And the second, is that only people with the lived experience of oppression are qualified and have standing to define it for the rest of society. Now, both of those things can be true. It can be true that bias and oppression are systemic. We've experienced it in various countries that Jews have been discriminated against. In. Certainly Jim Crow America, I mean, was systemically racist. I mean, how could you say otherwise? So it can be true that that's the case. It can also be true, by the way, that people who experience oppression know something about it. So as a Jew who has experienced anti-Semitism, I, I think I have something that people ought to listen to, right? I mean, 
Now, I might experience it a little differently than Howard or Rabbi, but, but I have lived experience that I should share. But that doesn't mean that I have the final word on it. Other people may have different views of anti-Semitism, and there may be other data points that have nothing to do with lived experience. So I cited the Pew survey that showed that American Jews are the most admired religious communities. So I have to balance that against my own lived experience of anti-Semitism. So unfortunately, when you, when you have this combination of, like, um, of, of an assertion that bias is embedded in the very systems and structures of society, and that only certain people have the lived experience and the qualifications to define it for everybody else, that can be weaponized in a way that stifles dissent. It says, if you don't go along with me and my perspective, then you are acting out of privilege or maybe even racism. And you really don't have the, the qualification to be part of this conversation. And to me, that's textbook illiberalism. You are not, you're shutting down that conversation. It also creates this very rigid idea of the, the oppressed versus the oppressor and who has power and who doesn't have power. Maybe we'll get into that a little bit. And when you have that, of course, it's very easy to la label certain people by virtue of their identity, no matter what they've experienced in life, as being part of the powerful or privileged classes and everybody else or uh, other people uh, are, are oppressed. And, and there's really little leeway in all that. And guess who often is viewed as the oppressor? or privileged. And I think that we have to be very suspicious of the discourse. I, I totally agree that critical thinking is the absolute antidote to it. Critical thinkers are naturally suspicious of very rigid, you know, very adamant statements that claim to describe all of reality. So I think that really ultimately is the answer to fighting anti-Semitism. Again, I'm sure we'll get into this. But to me, that's fundamentally what we're dealing with with woke ideology. It's a term that has fallen on hard times, and if we don't want to use it, let's call it something else. But that's the ideology I'm trying to describe today. A couple things. Well, first I would say, I suppose in Hebrew I'd say, nachon aval. <laughs> like, I, I agree with you, but. So first of all, let, let, let's be clear when we say, when I say critical thinking, when we say critical thinking, critical thinking doesn't only mean uh, asking someone else, how do you know that? It also means asking yourself, how do I know that? It means critical, being critical of things that are said to you that you agree with. It's across the board. No. Now, as far as the concept of woke, woke ideology, wokeness, I would first make a distinction. I would make the following distinction. There are no question, there are progressives and, it, and, and there are proponents of wokeness who are anti-Semitic. No question about it. But that does not mean, and is not the same thing as saying that progressivism and woke ideology is inherently anti-Semitic. That simply is not the case. And another distinction I would make, I think that would help clarify it a little bit, is distinguishing an overreaction from a necessary initial reaction. Because yes, there are extreme forms of wokeness, and you've already heard me say, I don't like, I, extremism is a problem in any shape or form. But we have to remember, that woke ideology, and I would say its precursor was political correctness, they didn't begin in their most extreme forms, they began as a necessary reaction to a problem of language. Now, I'm old enough to remember, in fact, it's interesting, I was having a conversation with one of my doctoral students, who's about 30 now, I think, and he was very surprised to hear that when I was his age, or when I was a little bit younger, growing up in the 70s, I, I was called a kike on multiple occasions. He has never been. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has had that very unpleasant experience, because as words go, that is a very unpleasant word, but I'm also happy to report that I have not been called that word in like 30 years. And, and one of the reasons for that is that the initial reaction that was political, political correctness and that was wokeness, was doing away, was removing words like that from mainstream, acceptable, normative discourse. There are people who still use it, but not people like us. It was no longer acceptable. And it isn't just that word. There's a whole list of words that we no longer routinely use. And I, for one, I'm very glad that my children have grown up without having the experience of being called that word. And frankly, I, I, think, it's, I think it's worth being a, little, being a little bit more 
a, you know, a little bit more considerate in the language we choose so, as not, so, as, so that won't happen anymore. So I think wokeness, if you can distinguish the overreaction, and definitely there are instances of overreaction, if you can pair that away without undermining or removing the initial necessary reaction. So the problem isn't wokeness per se. The problem is over, uh, over application, overreaction to wokeness. Now, as far as what you said about, uh, how did you say it? You, you said that uh, only certain people are unable to have an opinion. Well, I, I would draw on the following experience. You know, I was on the board of Hillel Day School for nine years. Another shout out to Hillel, I can't help it. I, I was on the board of Hillel Day School for nine years, and most of the members of the board were, uh, they, they, had a, a stronger, they had a strong business background. Either they were in business or law or something like that, and a lot of what the board discussed was budget, finance, accounting, things like that. And we would sit in these meetings and talk about it. Now, I certainly had an opinion, but I felt no, I, I mean, everyone else knew better than me. There was no reason for me to give that opinion. And so I didn't say anything. I think the, 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 what, I, what I would say about that situation is it's important to understand the difference between being silenced, which is unacceptable, versus knowing when to listen, which is enormously important. So for example, if there's a university course in women's studies, the goal of women's studies as a discipline is to understand the experience of women in history, society, and politics. Now, if I'm in a course like that, not being a woman, even if I've read a book or an article about a subject, I have much more to learn from the lived experience of the other students in the room. And similarly, if let's say you're, you, you ran an organization, your organization is trying to craft and figure out how to respond to or how to deal with, let's say George, the George Floyd incident, that, tra that tragedy. People from that community are better suited to understand that situation in all of its complexity and nuance. Now, if you have trouble believing that, let, let, me put it, let me put it this way. How would we feel in this room if people are, who are not Jewish handed us a definition of anti-Semitism and said, oh look, we've defined anti-Semitism for you. No, 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 no. We define it ourselves. But we're not the only ones who feel this way. And you know, I think, I, think the, I think the phrase is standpoint ideology. Standpoint ideology means the people who have the most intimate and immediate and, and complex and deep knowledge of something, yes, they get to be the primary voice in defining what it is. So, Howie, we'll Professor Lubovitch, we'll stick with you for a second. <laughs> Half the people in this room know me as Howie. All right, okay. very good. Uh, Let's, co let's come to the college campus where we often hear the, the accusations and labels of wokeism most prominently displayed. Can you take us for a minute onto your campus? What's been your experience? Where do you see progressive politics, wokeness being a real advantage on the college campus and where have you seen it go too far? That's a great question, that's a great question, thank you. Um, well, first of all, this, this, is, this is probably gonna, we're gonna drift into talking about Israel in this question, probably, inevitably, which of course is, which of course is fine. So my campus is unusual, first of all. I teach at Wayne State. Uh, you know, I came to Wayne State about 11 or 12 years ago. Wayne State has one of the largest Arab and Muslim student populations in anywhere in the country. So I came with certain expectations. I assumed with all these Muslim and Arab students on campus, they would just be trying against Israel, and there hasn't been none, but there's been relatively little, relatively little compared to other college campuses. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a, a, a pro-Palestinian, outspokenly anti-Israel group tried to organize a protest on campus, and I can't remember if it was 25 students for 20 minutes or 20 students for 25 minutes, but either way, it was, compared to what happens on other campuses, a big nothing burger. Now the biggest problem we have on campus, and here I will thank my friend and colleague Miriam Starkman, who's the head of Hillel, and she, she's the one who really knows this, but the biggest problem we have with students is the term is microaggression. The students are, you know, person to person, from fellow students and fellow friends, they are encountering this kind of thing, this kind of thing. So in terms of this kind of progressive or woke anti-Semitism, its primary expression is, in, is, is criticism is anti-Zionism. 
that form of anti-Semitism. That's, that's what we have. And there are students who have trouble with it. It's mostly a problem with students. It's rarely a problem with faculty. My sense is with students, I like students to be able to handle other students. If a faculty member is problematic, that's where, you know, that falls under my job description to deal with that. And, and make no mistake, if there is a faculty member calling, you know, uh, causing problems, yes, I'm on the case. I'm on the case. Incidentally, I should say parenthetically, that thing at Bloomfield Hills High School, I, uh, I've been in contact with the principal and uh, we're gonna talk about the possibility of me going in and, you know, that's giving an alternate version of the story to what Hoeda Araf said. Uh, but I, that's, that's just parenthetically. So I, I, I think, you know, I'm not gonna say the students aren't bothered. Just there are students who are encountering these microaggressions and struggling to deal with that. So I've had a chance to think about why is it that students on my campus and Jewish students on other campuses are having trouble responding to the microaggressions or on other campuses, these other forms of, these other, these other rhetoric and these other things. I think it comes down to two, there's really two reasons. I would say one is the secondary reason and one is the primary reason. So I'll give you the secondary reason first. The secondary reason is there are some Jewish students, maybe many Jewish students, most, I don't know. There are at least some Jewish students who prior to going to college, the only, you know, we, we've done a very good job with our children in America for a long time teaching a love of Israel. You know, when I went to Hillel, uh, <laughs> we, we learned about Israel every single day. We learned to love Israel every single day. And that was great. I would change nothing about that. We, uh, when I was there, we had the luxury of that. That was enough. But now students will, students, uh, when they get to college, or maybe even when they get to public high school now, because they haven't been taught, they've only been taught about Israel one way, they're not prepared, they haven't been given the knowledge to respond to criticisms, to respond to anti-Zionist expressions, anti-Zionist rhetoric and statements. They don't know how. And because they don't have, they don't have the knowledge, and Knowledge is power here, my friends, is, is, is if you know how to answer, it is so effective. Because they don't, we have one of two responses. Either they wilt, they're traumatized, they, they, they just sort of shrink because they don't know what to say, or they, uh, you know, as, as is the case with college students, when you hear something novel, you can be attracted to it. They're drawn over into that point of view. The point being is that a little bit of knowledge here, uh, you know, fortifying our young people letting them hear this point of view, learning this point of view in order to know how to criticize it and defend the state of Israel against this point of view would be very effective. I'll give you one personal example. My own personal example is when my own daughters got to public school this, and, and, and when, they got to, when they got to campus, they went to Michigan. So that, that was the, really the first time they heard it. They were a little bit freaked by it but I just gave them one book to read. I gave them Catch 67 by Micha Goodman, which you should all read, a great book. And they were fortified with this knowledge of how to explain, how to distinguish criticism of the state of Israel from delegitimizing the state of Israel, how to defend it. And it just wasn't a problem after that. Knowledge is an amazing thing. So yes, the problem is certainly there. But I think if our own, you know, if, if our own young people we're better, we're better equipped to handle it, they would do a, as good a job expressing and standing up for their points of view as all the rest of the students do. Because it's, it's something odd about Jewish students on college campuses. They seem to be the only ones having trouble sticking up for themselves. For reasons I just explained. Give them some knowledge, that problem will go away. So let's take it, let's stay on the college campus here for a second. How do you see woke ideology playing itself out and especially what's the impact on Jewish kids through your eyes? Yeah, so I think I'd probably regard wokeness as a bigger threat to uh, college students and to American Jews than, than Howard does. I, I, I think you sort of underplayed it there. Um, I, let me just give you the example, a pretty recent example of Ron Albacher who's a, a, a psychiatrist at Stanford University he was ran this therapeutic program for Stanford students and faculty um, there was this online town hall that they held at Stanford that was zoom bombed I don't know if you remember that zoom bomb where they when I think zoom got it under control at some point but there were swastikas 
and there was the N-word, and there were all kinds of really nasty things said. And the diversity, equity, and inclusion staff for this department at Stanford um, had a discussion about it, and, and, the, um, and, and, how, um, and Ron Albacher raised the question about anti-Semitism. He said, well, we're talking about the racism here, but there were swastikas, and doesn't that say something about the anti-Semitism that was present? And he was shut down. He was saying, you're decentering anti-blackness. You're taking the spotlight off of the black experience by talking about anti-Semitism. Um, they also forced faculty and in, in, um, staff into these affinity groups, you know, a black affinity group, a white affinity group, an Asian affinity group. And when Ron and another Jewish staffer asked for a Jewish affinity group, they were denied. And so there ended up being a lawsuit. Um, this is. This is a more common experience than, than people realize. You just don't hear about it that much because not everybody's willing to do what Ron did and file a lawsuit about it. And I think there's an overall culture that is pervasive in many institutions. It's not equal everywhere. It's not the same. Just as Wayne State is not the same as Michigan, you know, it's, you know not every university is going to be similar. There's a, there's a pervasive environment that's intimidating. It's not just about equip. It is about equipping kids to be able to answer. And I've spent years at the David Project. I was director of an institution that helped kids answer uh, effectively the accusations that were being made against them in Israel. But it's also about this environment this ideological environment that has now become dominant in many universities that defines exactly who the oppressors are. And because Jews on average, on average are economically successful and, and ha attain high educational achievement, they are viewed very often as a part of the oppressor class. And it's very hard for them to gain standing, to gain traction in, the, in that discourse. Now I'm not gonna say every community college and every university, there are 4,000 some universities of, in, of places of higher education in the United States is equally problematic, but a lot of them are. A lot of the places where Jewish students are most likely to go. And I think that that creates a structural disadvantage for Jewish students. And I don't think we've been talking enough about that. Look, we talk about the ideological underpinnings of right-wing anti-Semitism. It's easy. It's the great replacement theory that, that, that you know, immigrants are coming in and taking the jobs of ordinary Americans, and guess who's doing all the replacing? Jews, that's the right-wing ideology of the day. And we talk about Islamist anti-Semitism and the notion of the infidel, the Jew and the Christian infidel. But a lot of times when we talk about anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, we talk about it as if it's a symptom without any ideological underpinnings. So I, I had quoted Jonathan Greenblatt from the ADL in the beginning and talking about how there's climate change on the left and there's a hurricane on the right. But what he doesn't do and what we need to do more of is to talk about the ideological CO2 emissions that are producing the climate change on the left. What it, why is it becoming much more hostile? I was talking to my friend Ken Marcus, who runs the Brandeis Center for Human Rights, and they work on campuses around the United States, sometimes file lawsuits on behalf of Jewish students and pro-Israel students. He said, when I started like, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, um, the Brandeis Center, it was just me and an assistant, and I had a, a case every once in a while. He goes, now I have this team of, I don't know, 12 or 15 people working for me, and I'm dealing with 100 times more cases than I used to just 10 or 15 years ago. So the environment is becoming more challenging. And I would argue it's not accidental. It's not just because there are suddenly more anti-Zionists on campus. It's because the entire ideological environment has shifted. And I'm telling you, we're, you know, I know that you just went through a bit of a communal trauma about Bloomfield Hills. And I think that's the tip of the iceberg. Right now in Cal California, just as you may have heard, passed this um, ethnic studies model curriculum. Ethnic studies is not just about studying about ethnic communities. If it were, we'd all be supportive of it. But ethnic studies is about teaching this oppressed oppressor binary and looking at history and the American experience through that binary. And so it's not just you're gonna teach about Asian Americans, you're gonna teach about how people are oppressed. And, and again, I think it's inimical, to, very often inimical to critical thinking. It's not that people aren't sometimes oppressed, it's just that you have to be able to discuss it, you have to be open to it. And I don't entirely agree with you, Howard, that, that we should be that deferential to anybody's narrative on, on that, including our own, by the way. In other words, I don't believe that Jews just get to unilaterally define anti-Semitism. I think we have to be in conversation with a larger society. And if we do believe that, then we're not gonna be able to criticize anybody else's narrative. That's what liberalism is about. Liberalism is about giving ourselves the spaces to challenge each other. And to say, I'm sorry, I agree that you have 
I, I'm, I'm listening to your lived experience, but you don't have an unqualified right. Now, now that I detoured a bit, the California state model curriculum and ethnic studies is spreading all over California. And these groups of radicals call themselves liberated ethnic studies. These are extremists. I mean, these are neo-Marxists, self-described neo-Marxists, are, are actually selling their curriculum to local school boards throughout California that teaches that Israel and the United States are settler colonial states. That's what they're teaching. Now, okay, it's in California. Maybe it'll stay in California. Nothing stays in California. <laughs> not the... Not the you know wives of uh, Orange County or the housewives of Orange County and not avocado toast. It all spreads, and <laughs> you're seeing it. You're seeing radical ethnic studies now in many major school districts around the United States. You're seeing it in places like Minnesota. You're seeing it in Massachusetts. You're seeing it in Boston. The Boston City School District right now is teaching that Israel is a settler colonial state and the United States are settler colonial states. That is spreading. That is an outgrowth of this ideology. This, ladies and gentlemen, makes BDS look like child's play because it is much more widespread. It will be much more widespread. It is conditioning not just college students who are going in the humanities department at Brown about what they think about Israel or whatever. It's teaching the entire US public, K through 12, and an early age throughout the public school systems. They've been doing this, they've been working on this project for 50 years. And so I think we have some really challenging times ahead. And we in the Jewish community have to gain the nerve to push back against this. It's hard to do. It means sometimes alienating some of the people that we've worked with, some of the progressive allies that the Jewish community has worked with, that I've worked with. I spent my career building ties to progressive communities. But, if they're, but we have to be willing to stand up for ourselves. And that's not just about pushing back against anti-Zionism. Anti and anti-Israelism. It's about pushing back against the underlying ideology that's animating it. So, so let me offer a, an alternative version of what you say without the, without the panic. Uh, <laughs> because I'll reiterate one thing. Radical versus not. Yes, extremism is a problem. Ra people are, who are radicalizing this ethnic studies curriculum, yes, that's a problem. But that doesn't mean that ethnic studies is a problem. And, and, and go back to this notion of an initial reaction. The reason ethnic studies is necessary, the reason it's necessary is for a long time, American history, American culture, and I mean probably until the last 40 years, maybe eh, what, the 60s, 50 years, whatever it is, for a long time, American history was taught in a very narrow way. I'll be, I'll be more specific. It was taught in a very waspy way. From the American history textbook I used when I was in high school, which is just in the 70s, it's pretty recently, you wouldn't, re you wouldn't even know there were Catholics in this country, let alone Jews or anybody else. In my American history textbook, in the section on World War I, there was one paragraph about the Shoah. So ethnic studies, Ethnic studies in its proper form is something very, it's something constructive. And it's not something we should be afraid of. It's something that we should, we, we should help mold. Because ethnic studies be benefits us. Because, you know, it, you know, it's an example of ethnic studies. Jewish studies. Thank you. I, I, li I live in, you know, I work in a world of Jewish studies which would be impossible if there wasn't a broader interest in ethnic studies. You know, until the 1960s, there was barely anything in the way of Jewish studies in America. The only thing about anything Jewish anyone was interested in was the Bible. That was it. So, I agree. These people have, these people have gone too far. So what we need to do, first of all, we don't need to panic and we don't need to feel like we are under attack. The thing to do is to, to explain, to teach to show schools that there is a better way to do ethnic studies than what these more extreme people are suggesting. And you can still use the oppressor-oppressed narrative. You just do it in a more nuanced way. Because there's no question there are people who have been oppressed. I'll give you an example. Now, you're not gonna like this example. Some of you are not gonna like this example, but hear me out. Just promise me you're not gonna close your mind in the middle of this sentence, okay? Hear me all the way to the end of the sentence. Think of the phrase, make America great again. 
okay? There are people in this country for whom that sentence, that phrase, makes no sense because for them, look back at a time when America was great, it doesn't exist. If you're African American in this country, until the 1860s, you belonged to somebody else. You were owned. Literacy was a capital crime. Until the 1960s, it was a crime to use a, a particular bathroom. So that phrase is a difficult phrase. That's an example where ethnic studies can modify something. You know, don't take my word for it. You know who really explained it really great? This, you know the comedian Louis C.K.? He, uh, he has this great routine about it. If he had a time machine, you always wanted to have a time machine. Let's say you had a time machine that could take you into the past. If you're white, and especially if you're white and a man, there is no point in the past where you could exit that time machine and not have a table waiting for you. There's no question there is disparity. Now, it's the overreach you're right. The overreach is a problem. The overreach, and especially when the overreach ble you know, it bleeds into reducing the state of Israel into some kind of colonial venture, which obviously it is not. But here's where we can also, we slip in a little bit of nuance on these people. Here's where we can set them straight. And, and, and it really comes down to, I mean, the, 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 the way to do this and the way to help people in this country understand what it means to be Jewish and what it means to be Jewish as an ethnic minority is really through the concept of whiteness. You know, I think there's a real misunderstanding in this country about what it means, about what it means for Jews to be white. So 90, I'm not talking about Jews of color here. That's obviously a separate story. But 90% or so of Jews are white. We identify we are white. But, and we benefit from the privileges of being white. Let's make no mistake about that. But, but, and here, it's, it's the but people don't understand. First of all, we come pretty recently from a place, Europe, where even th where racial divides was not defined by skin tone because there were no people of color or very many in Europe prior to the 20th century. So in Europe, which is not that long ago for our families, a couple of generations, Jews were the quintessential outsiders and racial difference wasn't defined by skin tone, it was defined by hair and nose and ears and whatever other physiognomy about Jews they used. So we were the outsiders there. Here, though, it's a little bit more complicated. Here, yes, Jews are white, but let's be honest. First of all, our whiteness is relative and our whiteness is situational. What do I mean by that? You know, if I'm in a neighborhood where it's mostly people of color, I'm white. But there are certain neighborhoods in this country, well, when I was growing up, it was called Gross Point, where, even, where I wasn't really white, because to be white, you have to be Christian. Really, you have to be Protestant and of Anglo-Saxon origin. And in that situation, Jews are not white, but Jews look white. And it's easier for Jews to pass as white. Now that's a subtle distinction that is lost on most people. The difference between Europe and America and the situational and relative whiteness of Jews in America. Now if we can, if we can teach other people that, then, it, it, then we can have, we can have Jewish identity included in DEI discourse. Jewish identity becomes part of ethnic, ethnic studies and anti-Semitism will be recognized as a form of discrimination just like other forms of discrimination. Now you're wondering, can we possibly do that? Is that really, is that just a pipe dream? Am I just being a crazy, crazy idealist? I would say no, because we've already had precedent. We've already done something like this. In the last 30 or 40 years, we taught this whole country what the Holocaust is. Nobody knew about it before, very few people, but now it is something that people routinely know. And you're gonna say, yeah, but now there are all these young people who don't know because we have to keep doing it. But we've done it before. We, this is something, this is a matter of just simply explaining. And I, I, I'm sure we can, we, can, we can talk about this with specifically respect, with respect to Israel as well. So first of all, let me say that I agree that you can do a constructive, inclusive ethnic studies that, um, and I, in fact, my organization is working with others in multi-ethnic coalition to set up a new institute for, I think we'll call it inclusive ethnic studies that tries to actually promulgate this alternative model. So I, I agree 100%. The, uh, I believe in diversity. I've been doing this work my entire career. So of course, we should be able to teach our kids about how others live. 
Um, it's, it's more dire, I think, Howard, than, than you realize. I mean, this is spreading quickly. A little bit of panic might go a long way here. Um, you know, we are, this is spreading. I mean, and, and, um, and I think we have to take it seriously. And I think, unfortunately, too many organizations haven't really embraced this challenge. And they're worried and they're nervous about it. And it is spreading. And, it, and the, the problem is they have such a head start on us because the people who are doing ethnic studies are not doing the version that we would probably both love our children to learn in. They're, the, they, they are organized. They have institutions already. They are doing teacher training. We, we know what the teachers are being trained in. And so we've got to catch up, and we've got to catch up very, very quickly because this is going, this is an oncoming train. Now, whiteness, whiteness. Oh. So my uh, colleague, uh, Pamela Pareski, likes to say that when whiteness was considered a moral good, Jews weren't white. But when whiteness is considered an unmitigated moral evil, Jews are white. Um, look, I reject it. I, I, re I reject, I think it's a total social contract, and I don't think it has the power that people are attributing it to it. Of course, does whiteness in certain circumstances and contexts give us certain advantages? Yes, that is absolutely true, and certainly in various parts of times in history, that's been absolutely true. Is it always the case that being white is a privilege and being black is a form of oppression? Is it always the case that being a male is a privilege and being a female is a disadvantage? Is it always the case that being cis is an advantage in being trans or gender non-conforming a disadvantage? I think no. In fact, I think it's more complicated than that. I think oftentimes our ethnicity or our gender or whatever have very little to do with that, the way we're walking through life. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And I think it's a very, very rigid ideology that sort of holds out privilege as being this sort of, you know, uh, this, this, you've seen it mapped out on, I don't know if you've seen these, mapped out on these, on these, um, these triangles, right? The pyramid of privilege and who's at the top and who's in the middle. And that lends itself to Jews who are the most hyper white of white people because we're the, on average, do better than anybody else on average on, on you know, SATs or on economic metrics and the like. We are going to be put, whether they do it explicitly or not, on that pyramid of privilege. And I don't think, it's not even true. It's not, it's not true because we don't always have privilege attached to our identities. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. And I don't think that's the kind of discourse that gets us from here to there. You know, what do you think the very poor white kid is feeling in Steubenville, Ohio, whose dad lost his job 30 years ago, has very few economic opportunities, and, um, and, uh, and is living in an opioid-infested area. What do you think that they're thinking when they're told that they have white privilege, when they hear that construction, when they see, hear it on Twitter, when they see it on MSNBC or wherever else? What, you are, what do you think that does to their, their voting patterns, by the way? What do you, you know, and, and you know what they do, you know who they look at? They look at the people saying that as the white supremacists. They're sticking it to the man, and that's the man. And I'm saying it just, it doesn't expand the scope of empathy. We can, yes, acknowledge, of course, that America has a racist past and a legacy of racism. And of course, there's still racism in America. But to sit there and be fixated on who's on privilege and who has it and who does it and how much of it we have and how much we don't, yes, personally reflect on that. Personally reflect on how, what, what advantages you've been given in life. That's a very healthy thing to do. But to sit there and, and, and go along with this discourse that assigns it to certain groups, I think is a recipe for anti-Semitism, and I think it undermines the American idea. Let me, let me just say one more thing. You know, that I mentioned the time machine and Louis C.K., but, but also there is no credible, reputable historian who would, who would disagree with the notion that to be white in this country has, on the whole, been, been, been privileged. That white people have been privileged in this country. Yes, the, the young, the, the, yes, the poor white, there are poor white people, there are white people who struggle, but that doesn't belie the larger picture. You know who's worse off than the poor white kid in Steubenville is the poor black kid in Steubenville. Because, if, if, because the white kid at least has a greater opportunity to overcome it and more opportunities. So. Yeah, I mean, this, this, is a, this is an important way to understand the history of our country because it has really defined and informed pretty much everything. And in many ways, it's still true today. Yeah. Now, it's not all there is, but it, it, it is something, it, it, it's a useful first step to embrace it. You know, okay, go ahead. So we, we all agree that extremism in any form is bad. 
we all believe that the more nuance we can pursue, the better. So let me elevate the conversation now up another 10,000 feet. <laughs> as we want to pursue a more equitable America, as we want to pursue a more uh, diverse America, as we want to, maybe this is the way to put it, as we want to pursue a better America, and we'll let everyone define that how they want to define it, are we better off going down the road of colorblindness and blindness to ethnicity, blindness to religion, or are we better off going in deep to DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and really celebrating each and every person's uniqueness? So I'm, I'm going to triangulate a little bit on your, on your options A and B. I'm going to offer a C. Um, <laughs> look, I think colorblindness is a perfectly, even though it's now considered a microaggression, by the way, according to many university lists of microaggressions, now if you even talk about colorblindness, you're, you're committing such a, a microaggression. Um, I think it's a perfectly legitimate aspiration, and I don't think the racial classification systems that we've adopted out of necessity over time um, are actually working for us very well now. And I think at some point, I would hope that we all can get, move toward a post-racial reality and that it's, no one should be punished for saying that that is a, a, an important aspiration, an important part of the American dream. Um, and of course, we are different. We are diverse. We are, there are different groups and I wanna, I wanna celebrate my Jewishness and I want Asians to be able to celebrate their Asianness, and I want black people to be able to celebrate their tremendous cultural contributions and I want Latinos to be able to do the same and I want us to be able to be in conversation with each other. But I don't think that DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, the way that it's often done, not always done, the way that it's often done is doing that. And again, I think that it's the overlay of this oppressed oppressor binary that gets in the way of that. We can have conversations about ethnicity and about what it means without prejudging the outcome, without saying who's oppressed and who's the oppressor, who's privileged and who's not. I don't, personally, I don't want my kids to be taught by any teacher that they're privileged. I don't want them to be taught that, told that they're also oppressed. I want them to be engaged in open conversations. I want them to read Ibram X. Kendi, and, and I want them to be able to read John McWhorter. John McWhorter is a black intellectual from Columbia who's, who's very critical of Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote How to Be an Anti-Racist. I want my kids to struggle with these ideas, not be told what to think. And as soon as you go down the path and saying who has privilege and who doesn't and whatever, you are already prescribing precisely what people must think. And I'm not, I'm not, even, I'm not even sure I would disagree with you all the time. May, I'm, I'm, in fact, maybe I'll agree with you more than I'll disagree with you. But as it's still inimical to critical thinking when we're telling people who has privilege and who doesn't and why and where and, and how. And, and so I think the, the kind of diversity that we need in this country is one in which people can have open conversations. It's based on the liberal proposition that of free exchange of ideas. It's based on the Jewish proposition of machloket l'shem shemayim, arguments for the sake of heaven. And if you ask me what is most necessary for this country and what is most necessary for our community, it's that we restore our ability to have really good arguments like the kind that Howard and I are having today. And if you ask me what is the role of the Jewish people in this age, what could be our light unto the nations, it would be to create spaces like this in other communities. Maybe Howard will take this to the roadshow or something. Um, and <laughs> And, and show people how to disagree ag agreeably. Maybe that's the Jewish role in American society. Howard, before you answer, uh, we want to give people the opportunity. If you have a question, please um, raise your hand. We're going to collect them as, um, as you answer, if you don't mind us doing that. So we'll have some questions from the audience. Can I talk while they're doing it? Please do. OK. J Good. Just to clarify, Howard. If you have your question written down, yeah. raise your hand and they'll collect the written down question and then bring them up. So, so first of all, let me, let me address the last thing you said first. Yeah, criti cri uh, yeah. constructive debate, you know, good, good constructive debate, civil discourse, yes, absolutely. And I would say, I'll brag a little bit, we Jews, we, we're better at it than anybody else because we've been doing more of it than anybody else. You can't look at a page of the Talmud without some good constructive debate. I mean, machlochet l'shem shamayim is something we do all the time. I mean, not just in the Talmud. Come on, how many debates have you had today with just with, with, with your own family or friends? We, that, we do it very well. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Now, as far as what you say about privilege, and what was the original question about DEI? Was there another part so of it? Versus colorblindness. Uh, oh, right, the colorblindness. Thing. So, uh, first of all, as far as what you say about privilege, I think it's important to acknowledge the privilege, but there is a way to acknowledge it without turning it into, it, rather than turning it into some sort of vice, to turn it into an incentive, to turn it into a call. Yes, the people who are defined as privileged acknowledge it, recognize it, and also understand the responsibility that comes with it. If you are one of the haves of society and not the have-nots, you have a responsibility to help others. That is a core Jewish idea. It's on every page of the, of the Nach section of the Tanakh, helping those who have less. So yes, now in terms of colorblindness, that's a great question. That's a great question. And I'm not sure I exactly know the answer to it because I think aspirationally, it would be nice to live in a world where we could just, where it didn't matter. We didn't, we, 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 we didn't have to pretend we were all the same. Where we could just you know, describe these differences freely without consequence. But that's really only possible once there are no longer any consequences. Because who you are and how you look it matters, it still matters. It maybe it doesn't matter as much as it once did, but it definitely still matters. You know, I heard, I can't remember, uh, who, who I, I, it was a political commentator. Actually, there were two commentators talking, and, and, and the, one of the points they made is, if you're African American, let's say, and you're in a store, before you leave that store, you're gonna know exactly where the receipt for what you bought is in case you need it. and. Uh, I, I, I never think about that. I don't worry that when I walk out of a store, I might get pulled aside and, and, be, and, and be suspected of committing a crime. That is privilege, and I acknowledge it, and I'm grateful for it, but it also means that is my responsibility to help others get it too, to extend it to others. Now that is also, <laughs> believe it or not, what I just said, I didn't make that up, except the part about the receipt. I was basically paraphrasing John Stuart Mill, one of our classic liberal thinkers. Incidentally, I was also par par paraphrasing Sir Edmund Burke, who also believed that the haves of society have a responsibility of him. It was a moral duty to help others. So colorblindness, I don't think we're ready. It would be nice if we were ready for it one day. Now, DEI is another interesting one as well, because DEI is a great idea at this point I think you have a point where it's in the hands of the wrong people. DEI needs, if it could be stripped of the anger, the outrage, if, if it could be stripped of, it could be something less urgent, if it could be handled with a little bit more, uh, you know, um, just a, a, a more incrementally, I think it's something that could be very, very effective and has been very effective in some place. Because what it really comes down to is, you know, uh, the, about, about, a, about 100 years ago, so there was a great Jewish thinker whose name was Horace Callan, who, gosh, it's too bad we should still read this person. If you've never heard of him, just Google him and read something he wrote. Horace Callan is the guy who basically invented the concept of a hyphenated identity for Americans, and he invented the concept of pluralism. He defined pluralism as democracy for groups. Because there's, a, there's one notion of, you know, the basic liberal notion of individual civil rights is all in good, but let's be honest, there are differences in the way groups are able to appreciate that. Now, the other thing it really comes down to, and I think what DEI should really focus on, is not making everyone exactly the same, that's, you know, because that's really not what it is, it's equality of opportunity, though. Equal, if, if we had real, true equality of opportunity in education, in employment, in housing, in everything, a lot of these problems wouldn't seem so seem as urgent and pressing. So Howie, before you put your mic down, yeah. you had brought up, uh, especially on the Wayne State campus, but we know it exists on every campus, right. now it exists everywhere, this tension between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Where's the line? Ah, the line, I love defining this line. Here, here, here's what I would say, here's what I would say. First of all, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Let's just agree on that point, okay. Here's how I would say it. David, you tell me, you tell me if this makes sense. Uh, and you know, you know, obviously everybody, but Dave is gonna, he's gonna talk next. I want everything to make sense. I think, it, I think if, if, uh, if you start from the premise 
that the state of Israel has the right and must exist as a Jewish state which is democratic and secure, if you start from that premise, then any criticism of Israel is fair game as long as you start from that premise. By the same token, if you start from that premise, you can even be supportive of nonviolent Palestinians as long as you start from that premise. And what it comes down to is this. What it comes, comes down to is criticism of the state of Israel just as criticism in, in and of itself per se is not anti-Semitism. Where it becomes anti-Semitic, because remember, anti-Semitism is singling out Jews in certain ways. That's basically the essence of what anti-Semitism is. And singling out the Jewish state is also a form of anti-Semitism. So the core argument of anti-Zionism, you know, and the problem is not the criticism. The problem is, if, if problem is, is when you go beyond the criticism to say, and here's where the line is, that the state is illegitimate because of the things that it does. What I would say to people who say that is, what I have said to people who say that. For example, what I would say to this person who spoke to the students at Bloomfield Hills High School, or what I will tell those students, is, is that, you know, you can say the state of Israel is illegitimate, if you want to say the state of Israel is, is illegitimate because of what its policies and what it's done and how it's treated the Palestinians, you can say that if and only if you hold every other country in the world to the same standard. And let's, and let's be honest, there is no country in the world that can meet that standard of legitimacy, including our own, including Canada, including even you know, the really nice countries. No country in the world could withstand the standard of if you've done something, if you violated rights, you're illegitimate. That's where I draw the line. It's, it, it's de delegitimizing the Jewish state without delegitimizing every other thing. Now, it is possible to say the state isn't legitimate. You know, the example that always comes to mind for me is Cornel West, who is a severe critic of the state of Israel, who says it's an illegitimate state, but he does say those things about every other country in the world that violates human rights, including this one. If you're willing to, you know, in the, in the singular case that you're willing to do that, fine. But most anti-Zionists are not, so sorry, you're anti-Semitic. There's just really just there's really just no way around that. Anything, David, you want to add to that? You know, I'm trying very hard to find something that you said I disagreed with, but I, I couldn't. Uh, you're you're allowed to agree. You're allowed to agree. So you could I'm have gonna... said the same thing if you had gone first. It's because it's so obvious. I'm going to make a statement now that only rabbis can make to other people, but we never will receive it ourselves. I'm mindful of the time, so we're going to have to keep the answers on the shorter side. <laughs> Never applies to rabbis. <laughs> Can you talk for a minute about the role that social media has played in exacerbating radicalism and especially woke ideology today? Yeah, you know, when, when the internet first uh, came about, I think many of us were extremely optimistic that we were gonna shrink the world. I mean, we used to talk in those terms. We're gonna shrink the world. We're all going to get to know each other and our narratives better, and we are going to expand the scope of empathy worldwide. Wow, it really hasn't worked out that way, um, to say the least. Um, you know, what it's done is it's destroyed the intermediating institutions like, you know, Walter Cronkite and CBS News or Dan Rather and, and so forth, and it's allowed each of us to create our sort of own information bubbles. So I can create a Twitter list of the people that I want to follow and just get all their article recommendations and just read those things and be in my own little ideological bubble and never actually encounter a view that I don't agree with, or except those that I want to you know, contest actively on, on Twitter or some other social media act, uh, outlet. So I think it's done a tremendous harm, and I'm someone on Twitter, and I'm someone who uses social media, um, and I'm someone who even gets a lot of my news that way. I try very hard, by the way, to read from multiple sources. So I, I don't just have one list of, you know, I don't just have the brilliant anti-woke list. I have, the, I have the progressive list, and I have the conservative list, and I try to read articles from those sources, but I don't think most people do that. And I think it's, um, I think it's very dangerous, and I don't know how to solve the problem. Um, you know, I've heard all kinds of algorithmic answers. Um, I've heard, um, you know, people who say that the social media companies must, must stifle dissent, but I'm a free speecher. I, I want there to be free speech. I want to hear other ideas. And so I think it's going to 
Uh, I think this is a really tough nut to crack, and I'm not qualified to answer it. Can I go to a 30 second answer? Which I can do this in 30 seconds. So, so, um, dun, 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 dun. okay, so, <laughs> so first of all, it isn't just social media, it's also the false urgency of the 24 hour news cycle. Secondly, I agree with you about saying from reading from both sides. You know, you stay in Hebrew. So, you know, you can't get your news from just one source anymore. It's impossible. So I'll tell you what I do. Here's my formula. When I read news about America, I read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times side by side, and between the two of them, I can cobble something which I think approaches a balanced and pretty reasonable assessment of what's really going on. And in Israel, by the way, it's Haaretz and a publication called Makor Rishon. That works pretty well. Okay. Uh, what was the other thing you said? You made another really good, uh, oh, oh, how to, how, you know, how to rein in the social media companies. Well, the, no, the one thing I want to say first is that there's a part of the problem of social media is misunderstanding the democratization of knowledge. This is one of the unintended consequences because the democratization, the democratization of knowledge means equal access to knowledge, but what it's come to mean is that every opinion is as valid as every other opinion. And here I will quote Edward R. Murrow who said, it is ridiculous to assume that for every issue, both sides are equally valid. And, and moreover, if you have someone who's got real knowledge and expertise debating with someone who is just a blogger in their basement, those two opinions are not equal. And the democratization doesn't mean everyone has equal say in everything. There is such a thing as knowledge, wisdom, experience, and expertise. Now the solution to it, I think, I know, it'll be, it'll be 40 seconds. The solution to it is a pretty straightforward one. And simply hold the social media companies to the same standards and practices that other media are held to, television, books, radio. It's, this, is called, this is called Article 230. If they, were, if, if they were held accountable the same way that other people who disseminate and publish knowledge were, well, they, they would start, you believe me, the, the cost of doing what they do would lead Zuckerberg and the rest of them to start reining they, it they, in. It would actually shut it down altogether. It would, be, it would have a huge chilling effect on free speech and you would not have social media as we know it. I mean, you, because you'd have people constantly trying to police everything that somebody says. So I don't, I don't think that that's actually the answer. I think that would be very, very heavy handed. Well, 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 it would mean and you know, that social media companies would have to incur the additional cost simply of having more monitors. And I, I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's between shutting it down and leaving. <laughs> What's that? I just talked about it. You just, you just tossed the last question? Oh. Yeah, yeah, there's, a, there's a middle ground. <laughs> there's a middle ground between shutting it down and leaving it the same. And that is, you know, if, if there was a 10 or 15 second delay or a 30 second delay between when something is posted and it went public, and you could have someone monitoring it, and a lot of the hate we'd be able to vet out, and then social media could be a lot closer to what it was originally intended to be. Now, that's, that, that's a proposition which would cost a lot of money, but you know, if they would spend it, it would be better. All right, so I wanna try to take on one more question here. <laughs> You're gonna try. I know, right, I'm gonna try. Well, I'm gonna cut it off at uh, 8.20, as whether they're done or not. There we go, all right. So now we're on a clock. What can we do? I'll reframe it. I want this question, I want us to finish with a, a statement of hope, right? Because I don't think that we should end in a place of, of fear and, and concern, though we're legitimate in, in having some fear and concern for the, the place we're in now. What can we do to improve the ideological environment among Jews? And what can we do to improve the ide ideological environment among America? And David, we'll have you start. Great, thank you. By the way, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. So first, I think that we do have an ideological problem to deal with. And the first step is for people who agree with me on that to start to speak out more, to sh exercise a little bit more courage at work, a little bit more courage in your institutions, in your Jewish organization boardrooms, and everywhere else. We have to speak up and stand up for liberal values. And that's gonna require people to take some chances. I can't lie. It's not always pleasant to be told to, you know, that you're speaking out of line and you're engaging in privilege, but you have to do it if you want to stand up for liberal values in your institutions and in America and in the Jewish community. That's number one. 
Number two, we have to ask ourselves whether the current set of alliances that we've cultivated over the years are working for us right now. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean abandoning them altogether. It might mean to expand the alliances that we've traditionally had. There, there are Asian American groups who agree with us that there's there are problematic ideologies on the left and the right. There are black American groups. There are new groups that are coming into their own right now. These are opportunities that we have, but I don't think we're always taking them because we, we're so used to working with the same groups over and over again. Let's expand the frontiers of our intergroup relations. And, um, and third, and I said this before, but I really want to end with it. You know, I had a Shabbat dinner table in which I debated every Friday night. I would raise an issue, and sometimes my kids would go along with it, and sometimes they forced me to debate something like video game violence or something that I didn't really want to talk about. But it, did, but it didn't matter. And I was always the devil's advocate. Always the devil's advocate, no matter what. Even if they agreed with me, I was the devil's advocate. I think we need to start to model that in our institutions, in our homes, at our Shabbat dinner tables. We have to do more of what we're doing today. We've got to start being that light unto the nations. We've got to model what discourse and debate and civic engagement look like. And um, that's what our role is. And I think that's what we should do moving forward. Don't, don't just do it in the most easy, convenient way. Go to your, your synagogue, executive director, rabbi, board, and say, let's have conversations about the toughest issues in, in public life today. Let's have these discussions. Let's model it like we are here tonight. And let's set an example for the rest of the country. I would say, this will be either, either be three or four things. I, I would say, call out extremism wherever it exists and also point out to extreme representatives of a particular ideology or movement that they are distorting and they're, they're, they're betraying the, the, uh, the pure motives of whatever that movement is, that's first. Secondly, like I said, arm our children with knowledge. The more knowledge they have, the more they can stand up, then they'll be able to engage and also they'll be able to engage in a civil and constructive way. But also, I, I, the last thing I would say is the most effective answer to a one-dimensional point of view, regardless of what that one dimension is, is not another one-dimensional point of view. The most effective weapon, the most effective tool against one-dimensional narrow-mindedness is complexity, nuance, context, perspective. So I want to... I want to end with words of sacred scripture, but first let me thank you, Professor Lupovich. Thank you, David Bernstein. This has been wonderful. A huge thank you to the Jay and to Judy Lobel and everyone involved in organizing this special event. But we started with some Talmud. Let's end with some Talmud. Of course, we know that Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai debated and debated and debated, right? And ultimately, we determined that Elu Elu Divrei Elohim Chaim, right? These and these were the words of the living God. They both was merit. There was merit in both of both sides, both what, what they're saying. But ultimately, there has to be a decision. And so the Talmud then concludes that the halakha, the Jewish law, is in accordance with Beit Hillel. Why was, we'll give another shout out to Hillel there, right? <laughs> why, we don't have the Shammai Day yeah, School I didn't go in to town, Shammai right? Day School. So why was the halakha in accordance with, with the school of Hillel? And the answer is because they were kind, because they were humble, and they always cited the other person's perspective first. And I think that that is a good model for all of us to follow in our conversations. Thank you, everybody. Back to you, Judy. Thank you. And I want to say, as Howard was talking about educate your children, educate yourself as well. There's lots of opportunities to continue to learn. I encourage all of you to do that. I want to thank Professor Lupovich, David Bernstein, Rabbi Star for this illuminating conversation. I also want to tell you that David's book is going to be available um, in the lobby. We don't have Howard's book today, but we can get it for you if you're interested. And I can't wait till his new book comes out. And I hope you'll consider joining us this Sunday, May 26th, for another terrific program. It's a special screening of Babalo Boats, a Detroit fairy tale. And I think all of us, or most of us, have, we're on the Babalo boat. Um, and it's, we're going to be having the film's director here in person for a talk back and refreshments. Um, if you have any questions about what we do here, what all the cultural arts, all of our activities, grandparent programs, children's programs, families programs, please visit the J. You can contact me, Judy Lobel, 
Um, and I thank you all for this wonderful, very informative night. Good night, and see you hopefully soon.